Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our session today. I'm um, Sandy Stash, IWF member uh, in Canada, Montana, Ghana, and a former member in um, both Russia and the UK. And it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, just a little bit um, on my background. Um, I've been 40 years give or take, um, in the um, energy and mining sectors, and primarily in energy, um, and currently serve on, on a number of boards in the space. And I have to say, in those 40 years, um, I don't think I've experienced 18 months, um, two years, that have been as um, impactful um, to the conversation as the last two have been. If you think about it, COP26 in Glasgow, um, an important conversation on climate change occurred in 2021. Um, uh, I will say working in the sector that in and around that event, um, the views of the investor communities across the world, be it the city of London, uh, be it here in the US, be it in the Far East uh, and other parts of the world, the views on climate uh, and impacts of, of, of how to manage energy have changed drastically. And frankly, all of that was before Vladimir Putin uh, decided um, to take over his neighboring country or attempt to take over his neighboring country earlier this year. And, and what that's done is, is created a very interesting conversation about how to advance um, uh, the, the, the climate conversation in a way to meet the goals that the globe shares in that regard. And at the same time, important questions around energy security. And in that regard, we, we couldn't have a better speaker or a better company um, on the, on the, um, in the conversations today. Uh, um, first, let me introduce Barbara Harrison. Um, Barbara is the Vice President of Offsets and Emerging in a group called Chevron New Energies. And I have to say that's one of the more interesting titles that I've heard in a long time, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it in the course uh, of the next hour. Um, Barbara is based in Houston. Um, she's had a long career with Chevron, uh, serving in a in, in, in number of areas, engineering, uh, business, manufacturing strategy, value chain optimization, and retail. And it's done that uh, both in, in, or in Europe, in the North America and in more recently in out of Singapore in Asia and Australia. So um, we're fantastically uh, lucky to have Barbara with us today. Um, I'll lead with a couple of questions. And then, as I said, we'll have the, uh, the uh, Q&A session open for people to uh, add in questions as we go through the session. So um, Barbara, welcome. Thanks so much, Sandy. Great to be here. Great to be here. Well, wonderful to have you here. Um, first of all, um, and, 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 and I will also say as a woman in the energy business, and I know when I started, there weren't very many of us. So um, I'd love to start by you telling us a little bit about your background and how you wound up getting in the role that you're in today. Yeah, great. And I feel like I could spend the next hour asking you questions too and learning from your experience. So I'm really looking forward to this. And um, I graduated as a chemical engineer from Ireland, which is not really a country that is renowned for its deep history in the oil and gas business. But I was very lucky to get the chance um, to intern with Chevron while I was still in my undergraduate degree. And then the opportunity to move to California with them after I graduated. Um, there was a couple of things that really excited me. The industry I, I found fascinating, the scale, the complexity, the impact in our day-to-day -day lives. And also very transparently, I thought it would be great fun to go live and work in California. I was based at the Richmond Refinery outside of the San Francisco Bay Area. and thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to, to go live and work there. And um, probably like most young graduates, I did not have a long-term plan, but if you had asked me to put it down on paper, I don't think it would have still involved working for the same company 20 plus years later. But exactly what excited me to join Chevron in the first place has really been what's kept me interested in staying here. Um, you mentioned a number of the different jobs. I've had the opportunity to work for one employer, but have numerous different jobs over the course of my career. I've had the opportunity for my family and I to live in a number of different areas and different countries and really understand the business from a lot of different aspects. And so I um, have spent the last 20 plus years primarily in the downstream side of the business. And, and we always talk about crude to customer when we talk about the downstream. And I've kind of done every job from buying crude for our refineries to managing the relationship with our gas station owners and a critical part of the Chevron brand um, over that time. 
Fabulous. I'm laughing because I spent almost all of my career either in the midstream or the upstream. So uh, we, we, we sort Perfect of nice to compliment each other. So, well, interesting. And, and, and I did, um, I, I do find your title quite interesting. And, 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 and just, you know, for our audience, um, different companies are, are sort of finding different ways to manage how they run their legacy businesses, their, their you know, the, the traditional the businesses that are still a very, very big part of, of, of the companies. And at the same time, start to branch into um, new newer ventures, um, and um, you know, and, and, and I will say some of them probably are doing better than others. So, share with the audience, if you would, how Chevron decided to start this new energy department, and what you're most excited about as as, as its leader. Yeah, absolutely, and and it is, and I think you've alluded to it, right? That the world is in an energy transition right now, but one of the fundamentals is the world is still going to require an awful lot of energy, both for many of us to maintain our standards of living and also for many people to move into the standards of living that we really get to enjoy in the West. Um, but another fundamental fact is that energy is going to have to be lower carbon in the future. And so when we looked at it as, a, as an enterprise, as a corporation, and recognized the need for our base business to continue to provide that reliable, ever cleaner, affordable energy that the world needs, but also deliver it in a lower carbon way. There was a real urgency around how we were going to do that. And so building on work that was already underway within the corporation through energy transition teams, et cetera, the decision was made to stand up what is Chevron New Energies. And there's three main business lines that we're focused on, really taking a view of where can we build on our assets, our customers, our capabilities, to really drive the energy transition forward, and especially in those hard to abate industrial sectors that we haven't seen the level of evolution and solutions coming about up until this point. And so as part of Chevron New Energies, we have a CCUS, a carbon capture utilization and storage business line, a hydrogen business line, which is growing the hydrogen business. And then I have the honor of heading up our offsets and emerging business line. And so our offsets business line is focused on investment in offset generation projects, both nature-based solutions and engineered solutions, because we recognize although decarbonization is going to be a huge part of the story in order to achieve net zero, we also believe offsets will play a role both for Chevron and for other companies across the sector. And then the emerging business, I would say, was the wisdom of recognizing we don't know everything that's going to come. And so there's some early focus areas for us of really delivering those very low carbon energy sources. We're actively pursuing opportunities in geothermal, and we've looked at a number of other opportunities. We partner very closely with our Chevron Tech Ventures in some early investment in evolving technologies. But I would say it is, is the blessing and the curse of a job that is a bit of the catch all and be at the front of it and recognize where we have the opportunity to build viable commercial solutions in the low carbon space. And, and you asked as well about what am I most excited about with this job and it's honestly it's the best question I get asked because this is I've done numerous roles I've enjoyed them all they've all had different advantages, but this is a role where I truly feel that the work that I that my team that our organization gets to do truly has the potential to change the world. And it's not every day you get to say that about the job you get to stand up and do in the morning. Um, but I really do believe if we get the right players putting the right level of investment behind some of these solutions, the world will move on a different trajectory than the one that we're on today. And that to me is just nothing's more exciting or fun than that. No, absolutely. So, in fact, I was struck, um, if, if you don't mind me referring a little bit to your, your bio, as you talked about this group, um, turning strategy into action, mm -hmm. delivering on Chevron's higher returns and lower carbon ambitions. And, and I think sometimes, um, frankly, even in the investor world, that this is almost viewed as this kind of strange um, you know, strange, uh, you know, something has to go down for something else to come up. And, and I think you, you know, that sort of captures in, in sort of higher returns and lower carbon ambitions. And, and I think you reflected, I don't know if you had any additional to add onto that, but it, but it just, it's, it's an interesting concept and not everyone is using that. Absolutely. No, and it really is. I mean, the fundamental principle by which we all operate across the whole corporation is that we need to safely deliver higher returns and lower carbon. 
And I think at times that can be misinterpreted that the base business is there to deliver higher returns and that new energies is there to deliver lower carbon. But that is not the value proposition that we see. We see a real need to decarbonize our base business, but continue to deliver the oil and gas products that the world relies on us and um, relies on us for. But it's also the job of us to be able to build very viable businesses in the lower carbon space that we really see the potential to be able to do that. We're a few years behind some of the other renewable fuels, but we've seen those businesses move very quickly from sort of technology de-risking into commercialization and now into widespread growth in renewable power. We see the opportunity to be able to grow these businesses the same way and to be able to both decarbonize our assets, but also to be able to provide it as a service for other businesses because of the strength and capabilities we we bring. We're, we are an organization and we are fundamentally a business and you know this as well as anyone, Sandy, in the oil and gas and in the mining industry, where our job is to take complex problems and come up with solutions for them. It's probably why anyone enters engineering school in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. You like having those complex problems and having the job to come up with solutions. And this is just the next set of problems where we believe if we apply ourselves, we will be able to come up with those solutions, which will have broader impacts for the world at large. Yeah, no, no, it's fantastic. And, and you know, it is interesting. And I, and I am, you know, as a fellow engineer, a, a big believer in technology. And I know just this weekend reading something in Business Week, and it was it was vis-a-vis -vis some of the large companies like Amazon and how mm -hmm. they're actually having a very measurable impact on the change of energy demand just, just because of their sheer volume. And, and, yeah. and I'm going to go from memory here, but um, I know early in my career with Arco, we had a solar business, and I'm, I'm going to make up a number because I don't exactly remember it, but it's sort of directionally correct, $1,200 a kilowatt hour or whatever now 20 cents you know exactly. so the, you know I, I and you know and, that, and that's even even as somebody who knows how far the technology has moved i was shocked by those numbers so so yeah well, fantastic so well let's um maybe turn um because because transition is an interesting world a word excuse me and i think sometimes um in this context um there, there's a view that the switch is either on or it's off. And in other words, you know, we're all, you know, as a world, we're all, you know, in hydrocarbon, or we're just going to, to stop using hydrocarbons. And, and actually, when you use transition in other contexts, it's never that. Uh, transition is always a journey, um, um, sometimes a long journey. And, and, you know, and given that this transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources and is in the news every day, and I think recognize that it isn't going to be easy or fast, could you give us your thoughts, given, given the role you're in and the world you live in, um, on what this transition looks like over the next five, 10 years? Yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball. And if I did, I don't know if I would be here. I'd be probably somewhere else making my millions. But um, certainly, I think there's precedent that we can turn to to understand how the industry is continuing to evolve. Um, so we can't commit, we can't predict the future, but there are a few knowns that are out there. We need to deliver energy in a lower carbon way. The world needs to move on a trajectory that is more aligned with the Paris commitments than what we have seen to date in order to be able to really stave off a worsening climate crisis that could continue to evolve. And we need to see the growth of multiple solutions to be able to achieve that. And I think your question is so spot on, Sandy, that it is very easy to think black or white. It is very to think easy to think it's either renewables or it's oil and gas. And the fundamental reality is, I do not believe that this is an or game. It's an and game. We're going to need to deliver all of it. I've mentioned before, we need to deliver our oil and gas in a lower carbon intensity way. And we're very proud that we're already in the top quartile of carbon intensity with our base business, but we know we need to do more. We need to continue to get better. We need to continue to develop renewable power sources, similar to what we've already seen, the huge evolution and the huge growth that we've seen in wind and solar. But there's limitations to that. There's some very, very energy intensive industries where wind and solar are not going to be viable alternatives. And um, you come from the mining industry, and I remember having this conversation when I was in the Asia business unit with some mining customers in Australia and they talked about the fact that they need power 24 seven. The fundamental how they go about their business is through power to be able to work the equipment that they have to get their, their um, out of the ground. And it needs to be 24 seven. And so wind and solar can be part of the solution, 
with the level of power intensity that they have to be able to work the equipment of the size that they have, battery technology is an hour long backup. It's not a days long backup. It's certainly not a 12 hour long backup while the sun isn't shining. And so we do absolutely see the need to be able to continue to grow renewable power. And I think there's a lot of companies that are doing an excellent job in that. But we also need to drive these newer technologies to the point of commercialization. And that's where I talked about, I don't have a, a perfect crystal ball on what's gonna happen going forward. But as we alluded to, what we see is that when the investment happens in some of these new technologies, the first step is that you de-risk it, then you start to drive the cost down and then naturally the market play the role that they play continue to drive improvement, continue to drive that incremental improvement. And as you see costs come down, as you see the right policy incentives there to be able to uh, reinforce and to be able to drive investment, then you see them growing to being commercially viable on their own two feet and people are going out and getting solar because it competes relative to their alternative of going to the power grid, not because anyone's telling them they have to do it, not because anyone's giving them money to do it because it's become to the point of being competitive. And that's the kind of investment and support that we're going to need to see. And I think we're starting to see with the latest news like the IRA bill and the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, where you're starting to see policy recognizing the need for early incentives to be able to drive commerciality. Um, and I, that's where I see the investment going forward. It's where I see the industry continuing to move to, quite honestly, the, the world continuing to move to. And hopefully over time, we follow a similar path around commercialization. No, absolutely. And you're doing a really good job of, of sort of explaining the complexity of it. I, I, I had a funny moment at a, at a board meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, and, um, and it was sort of a survey that was put out on, on, on where, where people get their electricity, mm -hmm. and 81% of the respondents said from the wall. <laughs> And, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a little funny, but I, but I, but I think the, and, and your, your mining example in Australia is a great one because, um, you know, mining also plays a critical role in the transition because yeah. um, um, they're, they're mining the critical minerals, by the way, including things as, as, as you would say, simple as copper that, that are absolutely critical to the transition. And yet, you know, their energy, energy utilization, oftentimes in pretty remote parts of the world, um, is quite high. You know, and and you know, I think a lot of companies. I, I know Anglo American is one is doing some work around hydrogen powered vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. But but all of those have trade offs and cost, and 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 there's something about the complexity of of just how the system fits together. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, because you know, even smiling about the you know the energy coming from the wall. You know, I, I oftentimes um, re remind um, it reminds some of the younger members of my family that um, um, you know I'm all for electric vehicles. Um, they're great it, you know it can't wait but you do need to look at what the um you make sure that the source of the power that you're plugging into is 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 of lower carbon intensity than you know that than a gasoline power vehicle would be because you know certainly for an area that that is powered by coal you know and and we'll get there i mean again that yeah. transition thing you know step by step but, but you know how it all fits together is actually actually going to be pretty critical and it's really really complicated uh, you exactly. know and, and it's complicated in any given jurisdiction it's enormously complicated when you think about it on a global scale. So, um, Bill, so building on that, Sandy, it, it reminded me um, recently in California, I don't know, um, I have a lot of colleagues in California and I go there for work. They saw huge heat waves at 110 degrees in the Bay Area, which it, it's just, that is not normal temperatures at all. California has some of the highest penetration of electric vehicles. And the first thing that you saw happen in the same week where they were passing legislation that all new EVs, all new vehicle sales would have to go to electric vehicle by 2035 was requesting that people not plug in their cars to recharge because the grid was really struggling to keep up with basic needs around cooling and all the rest for both residential and industrial. And so to your point, it's, it's not just around the kind of last stop happening of, you know, are we making the investment in the renewable power to start with, which is so critical, but also the infrastructure that then helps to deliver it. And that's where, you know, this business is so interesting, has been built up over so long. And it's, and to your point, it's going to be a transition. It won't be an on and off switch because everything that goes into it is more than just the kind of primary point of the power generation. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, well, with that, on that note, um, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> oh gosh, what a good question. Um, you know, it's the exact same thing that gets me up in the morning. Um, and it is 
the size and the scale of the challenge ahead of us. And I think when I allow myself to wallow and linger and think about everything that needs to change in order to make this a reality, it's very easy to be kept up at night and to worry and to, I mean, I have three young children and a, a, in my mind, a moral obligation to leave this world a better place than how I found it to them. And, and that's gonna be a steep curve to climb to be able to do it. But that being said, that's exactly what gets me out of bed in the morning, because if you're not part of the solution, you can easily become part of the problem. And I get the opportunity to be a part of the solution every day, to be able to look at these really big challenges that are ahead of us, but know that we're putting the resources, we're putting the mind trust, we're putting the investment into really trying to find very viable solutions for them. And we're not just sitting and wringing our hands and saying, oh, woe be me, but we're actually looking to see how do we make this better? And so it's the size and the scale of the problem could, it keeps me up at night some nights, but most morning is what gets me jumping out of bed to come to work for another day. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that. I think the trick is to make yourself not jump up in the middle of the night. To go to <laughs> Don't worry, sleep has yeah. never been a problem. And that's the only one really thing about getting older. I do less of that than I used to do earlier in my career. Well, I, um, we sort of touched on this a little bit. I know I did in my opening comments, this, this sort of, interesting time we find ourselves in you know today and i think this year in particular um the, the this 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 you know the climate challenges you know you know which are there and they're extreme and they're getting worse and at the same time you know energy security and and um you know i um um you know there is um it, it, you know you know so sort of that is a backdrop and then j just a lot of interesting things that are happening in government and you you mentioned one um the the inflation reduction act which for those again who 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 don't live and breathe this every day has a very very interesting feature in in the tax code that that actually allows some very very large tax deductions for companies um, to to invest in things, and you mentioned it in Chevron context, uh, the uh, the for carbon sequestration and storage. So some things, um, I, th I think, a nice set of sort of carrots and sticks that I think will will very much move the conversation in in the United States ahead, probably a lot more quickly. In fact, definitely a lot more quickly than it has been. And then in other parts of the world, I know I have a former co uh, colleague in my company in London who um, is a geoscientist and project manager, and she's just been hired uh, through some funding from the UK um, to literally map how CO2 pipelines might be configured um, uh, in the British Isles um, for sequestration captured at factories, et cetera, for sequestration um, in the North Sea in some of the, the, um, the uh, uh, used um, oil and, and gas reservoirs that exist underground. So um, if you would touch on, you know, you've talked about Chevron's role. There are a lot of other players, um, government, uh, government support, you know, academia, et cetera. Do you mind it just touching on us for us, just kind of the role of, of those other parties in addition to Chevron and companies like Chevron? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's, it's absolutely critical. If, if we think about government, um, we firmly believe that supportive, well-developed policies are a really important aspect of our ability to then collectively solve these huge challenges that we're seeing. And I do think, you know, I, I want to kind of highlight it's those well-developed policies that encourage investment at the right time, that encourage the right type of investment to be occurring are going to be absolutely critical. This is one of the world's greatest challenges and it's not going to be solved in any one place. It's not going to be solved by any one body. And so starting to see, I would say more collective um, re resolve around the problems is definitely going to be helpful. I do think from a policy perspective, things like a uniform cost of carbon, which is really at this point, very much a pipe dream, but that is what you need to be able to incentivize investment occurring kind of globally and not just locally, because this is a global issue to solve and not just a regional issue. And um, what we are seeing evolving now is in certain areas, very supportive policy, very supportive investment, which is what's gonna be needed to take these very early stage technologies and bring them to commercialization to then be able to grow and scale and size and to be able to be competitive on their own two feet. But we talked earlier in the in this session about higher returns and lower carbon. And ultimately Chevron is a company that is owned by shareholders. 
we also have an obligation to them to make sure the investment that we're making provides returns. And so when you can be supported through that early investment, at which point you're still trying to de-risk technology, still trying to build the scale through very supportive policy, that then allows you to get to that point where that's no longer needed. And so I think the role that government has to play in this is, is absolutely critical. And um, I'm highly supportive of government policy that is technology agnostic. Um, I think some of what you're starting to see, particularly in the hydrogen space, you mentioned CCUS, but in the hydrogen space is um, a little bit towards winning pickers and winners and losers around what kind of hydrogen and how it gets generated. And I am a firm believer that if you provide the right incentive at a high level for the technology, but then allow markets to play out so that the right you know, players can come in and find those technical solutions, that that can be a huge part of it. Um, and you mentioned the role of academia and, you know, there's, we have a, I think of academia, I think of startups, I think of where the ideas are coming from. And that's a critical part of the value chain. We have a Chevron Technology Ventures company that is essentially like a tech ventures company that sits alongside Chevron is, and we do a lot of early investment in early stage startups that are still very unclear whether or not the technology is ever going to work. Some of those investments are now translating into real business opportunities for me and my business line. And so continuing to foster and grow the level of investment, the level of, um, excuse me, the level of, of research that's occurring both in academia and in small startups, that's where the solutions are going to come from. I think companies like ours will be able to help bring in the scale, the complexity, the project management, the execution to be able to bring those to scale as long term. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think you're, you're making a really important point too, because I think all of the players bring something different to the table. And, and I think, um, again, I think if we can, we can sort of get out of, you know, switches on, switches off, good, bad, um, you know, we'll come up with more nuanced solutions because I, you know, I, I do know and, and you know, um, aware of, of, of actually some of the, the, the seed funding I know is something that, that Canada and some of the provinces are doing, I think, quite effectively to, to sort of, you know, sort of incentivize or, or generate some excitement in the market toward, toward new solutions. And I, and I think that's something that, you know, you know, even coming, going back five, 10 years ago, probably wasn't as prevalent as it is today. So I, I, I think it's absolutely critical. So um, just one, and then we'll, then we'll go to the, uh, the studio audience. Um, but um, before we do that, um, what can, can the, the members of the IWF family and audience that are on, on the uh, Zoom call today, what can they do as individuals to promote a clean energy future? Well, I think they've taken the first step by calling in and hearing what we have to say, right? This is, I am steeped in this. I've spent the last 20 plus years in this industry. I spend every day working in it and I still learn something new every day. Um, I still get a deeper appreciation of some of the nuance, some of the complexity, some of the infrastructure that goes behind things that I take for granted every day. And so I do think for individuals to become well-informed, to be able to recognize when they're being sold a story versus when they're helping to understand an issue more deeply is really, really critical because that's what will then facilitate us to drive the conversation forward in, as we've been talking, an and world versus a us versus them, or it's an either or value proposition. I think the general public, the voting public become becoming more engaged, informed to be able to drive that dialogue in a constructive manner is absolutely critical. Um, I also think there's a lot to be said of kind of looking at your own personal choices and the choices you, you choose to make. You made the conversation earlier about purchasing an EV and taking that to the next level and understanding, okay, where is the power coming from for that? But those are the kind of steps that can, that can make a huge difference. You know, one thing that COVID taught us all, we don't always need to travel in person for every single thing. I'd love to be sitting side by side with you on the stage, but this is the kind of event we can do via Zoom and we're not all hopping on an airplane and traveling to and from and, and the footprint that comes with that. And so I think becoming educated, making informed personal decisions, being part of a constructive dialogue around what is a big problem and will require a lot of voices as part of the solution are all steps that individuals can make. But as I said, the fact that people are here and listening to this, they've made a great, you know, first, second or third step on that journey. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
Well, let me, um, let me just, because we have some very interesting questions that start to come in. And so it, it, don't mind turning one. And, and I'll start with one that, and, and I think, uh, thank Caroline for asking this, because it's a very direct and pointed question. And what I might do is, is sort of offer my perspective on it and then and have, have Barbara weigh in. And, and it, you know, recognizing the multiple solutions, market-driven transition to renewables, you know, that Chevron and other companies, many of the companies that I work, and, and a, a question about, you know, the, the, in, in, the, in the U.S. still receiving federal subsidies. And I think, um, and, and I'm going to build on something you just said um, to, to, to attempt to answer the question. Um, it's almost a sort of you have to go the next layer. And, and, and I'll just use a, use a company that, that I sit on the board of and do some work with. And the business model for this company, it's called Diversified Energy, is, is essentially to buy a lot of the older um, or gas fields or gas company, older gas fields, and, and, and basically keep them running longer than they would. And um, one of the, the, the federal subsidies um, that, that actually benefit the industry deal directly with keeping older production going. And, and it was sort of originally intended I think more economically for, for regions that had that older oil and gas production. But the irony of it that we're finding, and, it, and it's part of, of, of Diversified's um, work, is in, in buying older stuff, running it longer, but with the idea being that, it, and with responsible plugging and abandonment of those wells, is actually a less carbon intensive solution and, and a more investor friendly than investing perhaps in something that, that, that won't be put on production for many, many, many years. It's something in the, in the industry called a, you know, stranded assets and investors hate them by the way, because when, you, when they invest in something, they wanna know that what they're investing in is gonna make the money 20 years from now. So it, it's one of those things where, you know, something that, that, that you know, you know, you know is, 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 is a tax incentive um, in a way is, is serving the, the, the transition, again, the transition, um, you know, just by its structure. And, um, you know, and I, and I would say the same with um, the carbon sequestration um, uh, benefit, because another question came in and just sort of more specific on that. And, and Barbara, I'd love to get your perspective on that. But um, a tax credit that incentivizes companies, and many of them will be companies like Chevron and companies that I work with, that understand how to, to, to drill underground and understand reservoirs, reversing the extraction of hydrocarbons with the insertion um, mm -hmm. of, of CO2 is something that we actually, as an industry, do very well. And, 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 and those tax incentives will incentivize something that we need to do that needs to be part of the solution. So I don't know, Barbara, if you had anything you wanted to, to add to that. Um, yeah, no, and, and they're great examples, Sandy, and, and really appreciate you providing some insights from other parts and, and your board roles, which is very, very valuable. Um, I do think the thing to recognize is this is a hugely capital intensive business. Um, Chevron, for instance, has committed at least $10 billion over the next five years in just these new energies in this energy transition. So between our renewable fuels, US hydrogen, and then the offsets and emerging space. And so we are investing very, very large amounts of capital in the near term for solutions that will deliver or for, um, for problems that will deliver solutions over the next number of decades. And I don't think we're unique in the tax code providing that incentive for investment to occur. And so things like the investment tax credit, the production tax credit, some of the value on them is as well that they have an endpoint. If you don't make the investment before this date, it's no longer going to be available to you. So not only is it incentivizing investment in the US, it's also incentivizing that investment to happen sooner rather than later, which is a really critical aspect of ever being able to meet the achievement or meet the obligations of the Paris Agreement and to halt global warming at two degrees, right? We need to be making those changes today. And so we do look at well-informed policy. We don't think this is something that needs to be there over the long haul, but it is needed to kind of spur that initial investment. I've talked about it a lot that then helps to drive the commercialization, helps to bring about the scale. And it's not a, an industry that is unique to that. And the other part is, and, and as we talked about, we can look at renewable power and it is going to absolutely be a huge part of the solution going forward, but it's not the only solution. 
there, it's not going to be a solution for every industry. It's not going to be a solution for every individual. And so these sort of subsidies or tax incentives that are available to us and to other industries to really spur investment become a critical part of the solution. It, it really becomes the carrot rather than just everything being a stick at the back end. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's something too in that you said that sort of encouraging everyone to kind of, you know, take it down a layer and take it down another layer. Because the, the other thing that I found just just having the opportunity like you have to, to work in different jurisdictions, um, you know, oftentimes in the US, tax incentives are to what, um, you know, you know, a straight government investment might be in the UK. And I'm, I'm going to forget the number, some of my, 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 uh, uh, UK sisters probably know the answer, but I, I think the government is actually looking to put billions of dollars of, of, of more direct investment in things that, that make sense in that context, you know, you know such as, a, like I said, a, a pipeline system that might serve a moving CO2 around uh, for, for ultimate sequestration. So I think there's something about just, you know, understanding and, 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 then, and then I think, again, and this is what makes this so complicated, um, you also want to do the right things in the right places. And, and I, you know, and I, and I think I know it's, it's a huge, again, back to this sort of, you know, the conversation this year, and I will be the conversation over the next couple of years, as, as Europe, I, and, and I truly believe moves, you know, mo probably moves more aggressively into renewables, but how you bridge the gas that isn't going to be coming from Russia and what that means for LNG uh, and gas um, investment in this country, where um, in, in the US and Canada, in North America, where we, we produce that gas. Um, you know, we, we're just blessed with a, with a lot of, um, of a lot of shale gas that could serve that. So I think that, you know, just kind of taking it down a couple levels and then maybe looking at it more in a global context, I think, you know, you know is, is, is a bit, bit of good advice, I think, for all of us. So, well, I had another interesting question, and I'm not going to touch this one because it's too complicated. It must be for one of our uh, investment or, or finance uh, members, um, but, but it's a great one. And with all the, you know, the, the discussion, Barbara, if you've had of Chevron advancing new technologies, Given higher interest rate environment, um, perhaps a higher return hurdle, does that sort of, um, you know, does that change the thinking, I guess, on it, or does it does it cause you to kind of think about the business a little bit different, given given what's going on as we speak? You know, I, I think there's definitely a reality where interest rates play a role in the in the global um, in the global impact. I think of people's ability to be able to access capital, et cetera. And particularly as we talked about some of these smaller startups, some of these smaller companies, I do think that is an advantage of a company the size and scale that Chevron brings. We have an exceptionally strong balance sheet. We're at historically low rates of debt. Um, and we have we are able to make those investment con considerations with cash versus having to consider around what our current um, rate will be. We're also a business that fundamentally needs to take a very long term view and so are very sensitive to the individual impact that you know short term fluctuations in the market may have, but really look at these as investment decisions over decades versus over months or over years. And so it's not impacting how we're making our investment decisions. We've seen huge amount of turmoil globally, you know, since we stood up new energies over about a year ago, what happened with Russia and Ukraine, COVID re-emerging and then starting hopefully now on its final retreat, um, interest rate changes and inflation, a, a very strong surge in the price of oil and gas and the products that are our base products none of that has changed our commitment and our capital commitment to also growing these new energy businesses, which are seen as a key part of a multi-pronged solution going forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you made a really important uh, point in the beginning of that too, which again, I think maybe not be understood. There's a lot of different size um, companies in, in, in the energy space. And I know many of the companies I currently work with are pretty small. And um, you know, you almost, you almost have to kind of pick where you where you sort of fit in 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 in, in the supply chain or in, in the food chain or however you want to describe it, and I do think that you know the size and scale of of, of companies like Chevron and I think Chevron obviously on this continent you know one of the largest um, number one can really really move the needle, but but have the size and scale and um, the balance sheet you know to to take on things that smaller companies aren't able to do so. Another question, I actually from um, Stella. Hi, I'm one of my mentors, actually. So I have to take this question. Um, and 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 she has a, a great question. 
on, um, you, know, the, you know, obviously we've talked a lot about possibilities of different ways to do carbon reduction. And her question is just, in, and I think in the seat you're in, Barbara, you really it would be best to, to answer this. What do you think would have the biggest and earliest impact? So, you know, because obviously lots of things under conversation. And then, and then I think by definition, um, you know, things like hydrogen, et cetera, you know, just, just how you would sequence it. <laughs> Yeah, this is back to this crystal ball I need to go and find. Um, you know, I, I, I think hydrogen and CCUS, I can see early growth in hydrogen potentially happening at a faster pace than CCUS. Um, I think some of the incentives that are out there, also a lot of the hydrogen technology is a lot more familiar, has already been de-risked. I think the question now is you really start to think about hydrogen, not as an input, but really as a mobility product or an answer to firing a lot of different solutions that hydrogen can offer in industry. It becomes where can we economically produce hydrogen and where can we then economically deliver hydrogen where the demand is? And I think that's the, the big question right now with really driving hydrogen commercialization of being able to produce a low carbon intensity hydrogen and get it to where the demand is in an economic way. CCUS is an established technology, but is not quite as far along on the technology curve. And so you are seeing a huge amount of investment move that way. We are seeing a huge amount move into it. I, I think it will be a absolutely critical part of the solution as we look five to 10 years from now. I just think hydrogen may end up crossing that finish line a, a little bit faster, but I, I stand to be corrected. Um, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention, we, we're doing a lot of work of looking at novel geothermal opportunities, which is really taking the heat from the ground to be able to provide a truly 100% renewable, close to zero or zero carbon in some cases, um, either power or heat source, which has tremendous optionality when you think about the crisis that Europe is heading into this winter with the gas crisis being able to provide heat from the ground and directly into homes, into businesses could be a key part of the solution. And so um, I'm remiss if I don't mention it falls under my business line. I, I see tremendous potential in geothermal and we're really starting to see a shift in the level of investment and interest that is moving that way too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm only smiling because I'm in my last job involved in, a, in an oil discovery in the Rift Valley of Kenya. And, and uh, we found oil, but we also found a lot of hot water. So I, I, I think there's, I mean, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Again, I think there's some expertise in our industry that, that, that you know, that, that, that lends itself very well to that. And it's great to hear that Chevron is, is taking, taking that on. So, well, it, it, another question, and, um, and I think it's a good one maybe for the two of us as, as representatives of the sector. And, and that is what we can do, in, in, you know, in, you know, in, in the sector, um, and I'm going to say energy writ large to to sort of better educate the general public about energy grid capacity, etc. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe let you handle that first, and maybe offer some suggestions that I might yeah, have. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm anxiously anticipating your ideas, Sandy, on this <laughs> one. And, and I talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, it is so important that we recognize the need for nuanced conversation in this. And um, one of the things about the energy infrastructure, and it's because it surrounds us all, it impacts us all daily. I'm, I'm sitting here with my computer plugged into the wall, the lights are on above me, I have an iPad to the side. And so energy feels incredibly familiar to people because it is an ever present aspect of their lives. But most of us, to your point, really don't think about how it gets there. They go to the gas station and they just expect the pumps to be working and you can get frustrated if a pump is down, you've got to pull over to the next one. You plug something into the wall and you just naturally expect it to be working. And for a lot of people, it is only when the energy is unavailable that they really start to fully appreciate and understand the criticality of actually having it there. And sometimes, and oftentimes that can be at the worst possible times, like a hurricane impact or you know an earthquake impact or there's been some huge supply disruption like we're seeing in Europe right now and I think what is really helpful for individuals is have those conversations when you're not in moments of crisis because telling someone when they're already at their low point of well if only we had invested more in the energy infrastructure we wouldn't be in this problem right now is probably the least helpful conversation anyone can ever have 
But when you're sitting inside and it's cool and the air conditioning is going on a cool summer's day and we've just come off a very hot summer in Texas. So I have appreciated my air conditioning being back here, having the conversation then and helping to understand just how critical that grid is, just how complex it is, just all of the different parts and the different companies, the different organizations that go into allowing you to set your thermostat and not even think about it any further. I think it's just such a critical role that those of us who do have a little bit more insight into this because it surrounds us every day as a kind of public service to be able to keep the dialogue going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something, um, you know, because I've struck your stories and, you know, just just a couple of my own. I, I do a little work with an energy company, a utility uh, in the UK, and, and um, the, the, the UK has moved very decidedly away from coal, uh, coal mm-hmm. fire um, power generation. However, um, for the few plants that are remaining, we're sort of on emergency standby this coming winter, just in case. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, they, they too, they're old plants, they will be retired. But, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, how, how well understood that is. And that's, you know, that is frankly, um, to make sure that the trains run and the power stays on, um, you know, you know, in the, in the UK this, this, this year. And, you know, so for me, and, um, it's almost how number one to get people interested in this to to take the time like like a number of our questions here to kind of take it the peel the onion a little bit and go down layer on layer you know to, to better understand the complexity of these complexities of this yet put it in in language that is interesting enough and simple enough to um for, for people to sort of understand and 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 I know I, 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 you know, I question myself sometimes you know what what maybe I don't know about our, our food production, you know, the, and I think we all during COVID times learned a lot about supply chains on <laughs> things that we we all buy at Walmart or Costco or on Amazon or whatever. And I, I, I think there's just something, I don't know, maybe encouraging our kids to be very, very curious about how the world works. But I, I, I do think society writ large, you know, globally would be better understand for, you know, the, you know, for people to, to understand um, the complexities of this and, and the challenges, because, because again, and back to, to some of your, your earlier comments um, to the question about, um, you know, what, what technologies will go first or second, you know, things like hydrogen, and it does sound like a great idea, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure people really have exactly figured out the metallurgy yet, even of how, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, we understand how, how to make steel to move natural gas and, and oil, and I think to some degree CO2, hydrogen kind of creates its own complexities. And they're all solvable uh, over time with, with, with smart people, and there's a, a lot of smart people in the world. Um, but again, how to, I, I think we'd all be well served if people understood this better than, than we probably all do. So um, another question from Donna, um, just kind of an interesting one, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has greatly impacted global energy supply. And I you know, I know we've both spoken to the, the Europe situation, but, but but absolutely correct, the global energy supply. Um, what what do we think um, um, would speed up the, or, or what, had, what has this done to speed up the need for governments to create more self-reliance in the energy space while creating new technologies? And, and I'm reading into that a little bit even, because um, there's kind of, a number of schools of thought, I think, on um, you know, uh, you know, take care of ourselves first. You know, I mean, because because right now the energy market, you know, even with gas increasingly, it, it is a lot more of a, of a global, you know, a global system. But any ideas we might have that for government, I guess, to create a more, you know, more self reliance in the energy space and and still advance the climate. Um, yeah, th- this is a great question. And Sandy, I think your experience in Europe is probably more recent than some of mine. I'm certainly interested to hear your thoughts too. As I think as you step back from this and, and look at it, and there's a humanitarian and personal crisis that I think is everyone is aligned on and is it's difficult to comprehend, but at least we can, we can see it and agree on, on what is happening. As you look at the energy landscape, I think there's a lot of different people that are taking very different takeaways from what is occurring. And so the question here sort of leads to the need to become more self-reliant. I think there's also a caution as you look at the steps that Europe has taken in the last number of years, very, very actively moved away from coal, but also very actively moved away from nuclear and maintained a very high commitment even through all this to move away from what is a 
by definition, a low carbon source of power and shifted that over to gas. And I think, you know, the argument that could certainly be made is that is a tremendous risk that comes with being reliant on a single provider for anything. Um, and the reliance that a lot of Western Europe and Eastern Europe had on Russian gas has been hugely, hugely impactful and will continue to be felt. But I do think as well as sort of saying, hey, what can governments do to be more self-reliant is also keeping in mind the full scope of the solutions. And when you decide that this is good and this is bad, and then turn off all that is bad without fully knowing that what is good is going to continue to be there, it can have very, very real impacts. And so I do think it will be very fascinating to watch over the next few years as Europe tries to build a much more sustainable, diversified source of energy supply that I think the US will play a role in through LNG, but that's not an overnight solution. You've got to build the regasification plants, et cetera, to be able to make that a real solution for Europe at the scale they need in the long term, but also to hopefully take a more measured view across the energy transition and ensure that what you are transitioning to is there and there in the abundance and scale that you need before you turn off what you're transitioning from. Because I was at a conference last week called Energy Disruptors and one of the panelists who's the chief economist at Shell made a fantastic point when he highlighted the last thing we can afford in energy is disruption. It has to be an orderly transition or you get to see very real human impacts of policy decisions that are made. And so, I do think continuing to develop in all of the above solutions, but making sure that that's really understood and what those impacts could be. Yeah, no, I, I could not agree with you more. And I, and I think, again, the other thing that that um, is, is understood by some, but not everyone, is the long lead times in everything about energy, whether it's, whether it's you know, building a wind farm offshore Holland, or it's investing in a nuclear plant, or it's, um, you know, binding and then developing the, the, the necessary infrastructure to, to extract gas or move gas or oil. All of that has extraordinarily long leads time. And, you know, and, 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 and you know, just how that all fits together without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because I think, unfortunately, uh, you know, for Europe, um, you know, I mean, th this is a disruption. And, and um, you know, it, it, and it's been interesting, even, you know, some of the decisions that were made, and I think largely in response to, to some of the tragedies around Fukushima and others on nuclear um, are being rethought because, um, you know, and, and, and you know, whether it's big nuclear or it's, you know, what's now talked about sort of small nuclear, um, you know, sort of all of the above, I think is going to be critical, you know, as, as we look how we, how, we, how we provide the energy we need as a, as a growing society and, and the world. We had a, a great question, and I'm, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to add anything to this, but um, how about batteries, uh, battery technologies, um, you, know, you know, current battery technology has its own environmental impacts, are there better technologies on the horizon? Um, in, yeah, I, I wish I was more informed on the better technologies, and there's certainly <laughs> a lot of work in this space around technology development. We have assumptions around continuing improvement in battery technology, but it's not necessarily a focus area for our investment. And I also think there's some great companies out there doing really interesting work around just like power optimization and when the batteries are used and when you are when you're generating power through renewables, when you're storing, when you're providing into the grid, all the rest. So I 100% see there will be continued um, growth, investment, improvement in the technology that similar to what we've seen continuing on that curve. I, I do think the reality um, you mentioned the environmental impact around batteries, and I, and I think that is very real. I do think there is also a political impact, and we've talked about it, all of the above solution. And when you look where a lot of the precious minerals and the metals come from for batteries, I think what we want to make sure is that we are building diversified supply chains that are not reliant on single providers. And, and in the battery space and in that technology space, an awful lot of that is currently either from within China or under Chinese control. And I do think, you know, Sandy highlighted it earlier, we all became supply chain experts during <laughs> COVID. Um, but I do think really understanding what those supply chains look like, are we continuing to develop and build diversified supply chains that will not be subject to kind of a singular point of impact 
as you think about it. So I think there's the environmental aspect to consider. You're absolutely right. There's also a geopolitical aspect to consider that, that's going to be critical in making sure we're really building a long-term, sustainable, viable solution um, as part of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that might be a, a good question. I know um, there's a, a panel in the upcoming conference in Las Vegas on critical minerals. And, you know, yeah. whereas I could probably point to some of those critical mi minerals, what I don't have a sense of, and I'm sort of in the industry, is um, what the scope and scale and volume you know, you know, in order to to truly do everything that that are needed in 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 the transition with these critical metals, how much is needed, and and as you say, that there actually are pretty limited parts in the world, uh, limited parts of the world where um, these minerals actually exist or have been you know discovered and and exploited, and and of course always you know with mining you know the, the you know the the, the positive negatives you, you know you know around that industry too. So I, I think in for some interesting times. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. So um, let me, um, I, th I think we're probably down to just maybe one more question. And, and, and I'll, I'm gonna paraphrase this one, um, it, it, but it was really just sort of around from, from Chevron's perspective, the way that, that you guys balance um, the, the sort of reducing carbon and, 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 and the need to, um, to, to basically keep your shareholders happy. You know, uh -huh. you know, obviously people invest in Chevron like they do anywhere to, to get a rate of return. And, and, and just, to, you know, any insights you have on that before we, we get to the end of our time? Yeah, no, it is. And I mean, it comes back to our, our motto around safely delivering higher returns and lower carbon. It's a critical part for us. Um, and these businesses cannot just be about delivering lower carbon. We need to have a view or a pathway towards where these can be long-term viable commercial businesses in and of themselves. And so, although we recognize in some of the early stages, they are not necessarily going to be hugely accretive to the returns that we're able to offer. We do view that as a long-term investment in kind of the viability of our industry. And as the world continues to transition, we certainly see in, in the next number of decades, oil and gas will continue to play a huge role, but we do recognize we are in a transition. I think it's happening a little bit faster than a lot of us would have expected five or 10 years ago. And so it's critically important. We have been around for over 140 years. Um, uh, some of our early products were around street lamps, you know, and, and early yeah. kerosene and even whale oil, going back to when they first used that, right? And, you know, gasoline came around and was a huge energy solution to a growing, growing issue of horse excrement on the streets, right? So we have been in transition, I would say, since the day our company was founded over 140 years ago. We will continue to evolve to meet the, uh, the needs of, of the population. We are committed to delivering energy safely, reliable, ever cleaner and affordable. And so as I look at this, it is another step in being able to do that. We need to do it in a way that is, is true to our shareholders and helps to deliver them value. But I, we very much take a long-term view in that and not just a short-term one to two years, but making sure we're building the energy infrastructure. So we're around 140 years from now. Yeah, well, fantastic. And, and that is, by the way, a wonderful way um, to, to come to the close of our um, of, of our session today. So, uh, Barbara, first of all, th this is this was actually really fun. Um, and, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, and in the spirit of IWF, uh, it would have been a nice conversation to have, uh, you know, either either in the in the conference over or over a glass of wine or whatever. But I'm sure we'll have the opportunity um, to do that in not not too distant future. But thank you for your contributions on uh, what is a really, you know, one of the most important topics right now, I think, you know, across the world. Um, and, and, and I know in our membership, of course, bridges the world. So thank you for your contributions. And I also wanted to thank your employer, Chevron, because um, I, I, I learned this just the other day that the Chevron actually has been in a partnership uh, with the IWF for, I think, coming on 10 years. So um, it, it's it's wonderful to, to part you have you as part of our, our family of partners. And um, I also want to thank everyone um, who's, who's um, in the audience uh, for your very thoughtful, insightful, um, direct uh, questions and look forward to, to speaking with, with many more of you about this in the future. And like I said, if, if nothing else, we'll, we'll talk about critical minerals at the upcoming conference. So thank you, Barbara. And uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. All right, and have, have, have a lovely, uh, lovely rest of your week. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you.